news you can use. And today we're going to do part three of our kind of in-depth analysis of the Fed, interest rates, and in particular, how they affect those of us in the housing industry. Um, I'll talk about the housing industry part at the end, and we're going to mainly discuss the Fed, supply chain, economics, and the law of unintended consequences today. But what I'm going to do to start with is we're going to have a, just a simple breakdown and discussion about supply and demand so that we're all on the same sheet of music. So supply and demand, uh, economically, worldwide, they run independent of each other. Sometimes one can create the other or cause the other to go up or down. But ultimately, at the end of the day, all societies worldwide since the beginning of time would, would love to have an ideal balanced supply and demand. In other words, supply isn't up here and demand down here or vice versa. You want to balance. Part of what the Fed does, and they're, one of their main jobs, besides keeping inflation under control, is using that inflationary tool to keep supply and demand balanced. So let's look at some recent examples of where uh, supply, and, and sometimes these can be artificially manipulated, uh, and they're caused by other events too, so we'll talk about them. Everybody remembers this, right? Two years ago during COVID, we had a toilet paper shortage, uh, supply shortage. Was it a real shortage? Absolutely. There was not enough toilet paper being manufactured because everybody was hoarding it. So there was an artificial, artificially created demand. The demand got very high. Supply got very low on this stuff. So this was a real supply chain shortage. They had not planned for, nor could they make worldwide enough toilet paper to cover everybody's hoarding needs. Uh, once again, artificially created because of the COVID thing, this demand got out of control. People got panicked. They had to load up their storerooms. And I'm sure most of you on this call probably can go out in your garage or in your storage closet and find cases of this stuff still sitting there. So this is a case where there was a true shortage, right? Today, we got this, gasoline. So supply demand issues today. The demand is flat. There's not a high demand. It's not an abnormally low demand either. It's just a flat, normal demand. But the supply has gone down. Why? It's artificially created. Uh, we shot ourselves in the foot in this country by shutting down our own pipelines. We were energy efficient three, four years ago completely. We didn't have to buy a drop of oil from other overseas countries. Administration shut down pipelines and our ability to produce our own oil. So now we rely on, guess who? The Ukrainians, the Russians, and people like that. Well, you know, the next thing you know, the fit hits the shan and someone's staying after school for detention. That's us because there's a war going on. We can't get the oil that we need. Other people are jacking the price up. So we've got a manipulated, uh, you know, an artificial supply thing. There's not a shortage of gas worldwide. There's plenty of gas. We just have it shut down. We're not producing it, even though it's there, it's available. We've got to turn on the spigot and get those kind of things going. So here you've got a flat demand and you've got a very short supply. Uh, the reason that uh, these kind of examples are important is because this is the kind of stuff that the Fed focuses on with regard to interest rates. Unfortunately, we got off of what used to be called supply side economics. This was what Reagan came up with, supply side economics. Supply side economics, pretty simple. It basically said, let the market determine its own stuff. Uh, if people wanted more, manufacturers, producers were smart enough to be able to supply that and they would go out and create additional supply to supply the demand that was necessary out there. If the demand fell off because the product fell out of favor, think Betamax tapes or uh, you know even eight track cassettes. I wish they had those things. I used to have a really cool eight track player in my Mustang, 67 Mustang, but I diverge, I diverge. Um, nonetheless, there are things that fall apart uh, in terms of demand. They're no longer in demand. The supply catches up and then reduces the supply of those things until they go away and they're no longer needed. Um, the Fed, though, has gotten involved over the last, primarily since the last Great Recession, started in 2008, and they basically threw out this Reagan principle of supply-side economics, and they said, we're going to artificially manipulate the demand by virtue of changing the interest rates out there. And so the theory goes like this. Forget the supply. We'll, we'll manipulate the demand by manipulating the interest rates. The interest rate's low. That'll cause more people to borrow. That'll cause more businesses to start. That'll cause more people to be hired. 
If we raise the interest rates, it's just the opposite. There'll be less employment, more people will be fired, more businesses will shut down, the economy will slow down. So what happened is we artificially manipulated the money supply during the COVID deal where the government here in this country was giving out billions upon billions of dollars and people like people worldwide and since the beginning of time do, all of a sudden you get a windfall, you win the lottery, right? What do you do? You get a $4,000 check in your mailbox you weren't figuring you're gonna have. You go out and spend it, right? Now, smart people spend it on this. Uh, some people uh, who weren't so smart spend it on lottery tickets or you know other consumables that didn't last long. Um, and I'm not saying it was smart to buy a lot of this, but if you still got it, you can still use it. Uh, nonetheless, it's the law of unintended consequences has said what's happened now is the Fed has created this, artificially created this demand by virtue of letting the government hand out all this free money two years ago. It created more demand because the supply of money was high. The demand on these things gets high. And so the Fed comes in and they're, they're really between a rock and a hard place because they've abandoned letting the market do its own thing, let it set its own rates, let it set its get the government interference and intervention away from the business sector. Um, it is manipulated. So you've got a manipulated uh, supply side. You've got a manipulated to a certain degree demand side because of things like giving out the free money. Free money, once again, gets people to spend. Nobody, very few people, Not I wouldn't say nobody, but I would say less than 5% of the people in this country, probably more like 1% or less, still have the money that was given to them free from the government two years ago. I bet you everybody, including myself, has spent it all already. So, you know, very few savers, a lot of spenders. Um, you know, it's it's like giving, you know, free crack to a, you know, a, a crack addicted person. What are they going to do with it? They're going to snort it, use it, shoot it, whatever. It's the same thing with the money supply. So the Fed has to come in and now tamp down that demand. But when they do that, they're going to kill the supply side as well. So you're going to see, and you're seeing it right now in the housing market and other markets, you're seeing both demand and supply come down. Now, to a certain degree, they're coming down at different rates, right? Uh, demand for a few things is still high. Houses, for example, demand is still higher than supply. Uh, but as they drop that supply uh, thing down too, you're going to see this economy crash and it's going to crash across the board. They're going to have a lot of people that because interest rates are high, uh, a lot of businesses have to go out of business. A lot of businesses can't expand. A lot of businesses can't afford to buy equipment and increase their manufacturing capacity. Uh, nor would they because on the other side, the buyers, the people who demand their products don't have money anymore because they're out of jobs. They got laid off at work. Uh, you know, they can't go borrow money from HFC or Wells Fargo on a personal line of credit to go spend it uh, because these guys, their demand, their supply of money and their their demand has reduced. So you know, everybody trenches down. And uh, the unintended consequences is because of the way that we've set this thing up and because we've abandoned supply side economics, we are going to crunch this economy at a much faster pace. You're seeing it right now in the housing industry. You're seeing rates uh, on mortgages skyrocket because of the interest rates being raised and you're seeing demand for houses drop, albeit remember there was 6X demand. In other words, in January this year, there were six buyers for every house that was on the market. Now, today, there's three for every house that's on the market, which is still plenty. We're not to the point where we've got more than a six-month supply. In fact, it's like 3.3 months supply in the housing market out there right now. But we have artificially reduced supply. We've artificially reduced demand. And it's a tailspin that, in my opinion, we're not going to be able to get out of, short of them doing something they've never done before. And we talked about this last week, and it's to, rate, it's to lower interest rates next year. I think that's the only thing that will save this economy from going into a tailspin and totally crashing. In the meantime, there are these gold mines of markets and supply demand imbalances that are literally in a perfect storm. And I can't emphasize this enough, but the housing market is in a perfect storm right now. You've got a lot of sellers with a lot of equity, and they have a lot of interest in getting rid of their their supply, their house. They want to sell their house because of things like death, divorce, taxes, bankruptcy, job loss, medical issues, having to move, family issues, those kinds of things. Um, and 
there are buyers out there who would love to buy their house, but can no longer because interest rates are so high. So, of course, one of the things that, you know, in, the, in our courses we teach is how to bridge that gap. Basically, it's an arbitrage play. There's, you know, there's a big demand, uh, relatively speaking, less demand than there was, but there's a big demand. And, you know, the supply is getting bigger. They're going to be in balance at some point, a six-month supply. Uh, but you can be at the front of the line. And th this literally is going to be like a, a poor man's hog trough. You're going to be able to get in there first, and you're going to be able to feed until you blow up. And you might as well do it. It's somebody's going to do it. Um, you might as well be the one that gets out there and do it. We teach this. This is what transactional engineering is all about, so learning creative financing. But I'll tell you, I've never seen this before where it's great on the rehab side and it's great over on the transactional engineering side. You have a chance to make money two ways or 15 ways the way we teach it. And I would encourage everybody to dig deep. This thing ain't going to last long, in my opinion. You know, could last another year. Uh, but this is literally the perfect storm for housing because of what the Fed's done, their abandonment of supply side economics and the law of unintended consequences. They don't have the requisite bazooka or they've been carrying it around, but they don't have the ability, nor do they have the temperament to want to fire it. So it's up to us to go out there and make money until somebody with some common sense wakes up and says, hey, we're, we're screwing up everything here. We're going to totally crash the economy. You know, this, this knee-jerk reaction, they're going to go back the other way, and they're going to start handing out money like candy to everybody. They'll come up with some reason, monkey pox, whatever, um, you know, to hand out more money. And that'll spur demand back up, and it'll bring everything back up. But in the meantime, there is the, – these windows are the windows that you can look back historically from an economic standpoint that people have been able to monetize. And these are the times when millionaires are made really in a very short period of time, you can be at the right time, the right place. You guys have all heard these stories and I've told this opportunity story uh, several times on this channel, but one of the things really influenced me back when I was in college, I was uh, president of the investment club at the university that I was in. And a lady had passed away and given us $100,000 to spend uh, to invest. It was, that was our job was to invest this money and just you know, learn about stock market and things like that. Um, I had picked one stock in particular that had just come on the market recently, within the last year or so at that time. And, but the other members all wanted to diversify and put it into a basket, a portfolio of other stocks. Um, I didn't have the strength of my own convictions. I should have put my foot in the sand and said, listen, I want us to put our money into that stock. We went ahead and did this basket portfolio of different stocks. And you know, they, some went up, some went down, whatever. I look back about 15 years ago to what that stock uh, would have been worth at this point in time uh, had we spent that hundred thousand dollars on that stock. That stock would have been worth thirty three million dollars, and that stock was Walmart when it first became public. So I learned from that there is always opportunities out there, and that was during a downturn, uh, recessionary period. Eighties uh, stocks were down, housing prices uh, were down, interest rates were up, uh, you know that type of thing. And there is always those types of deals out there. The smart money keeps their eye on these things and knows when to pounce. Now, you know, I don't necessarily have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I've been around long enough that I've seen this stuff go up and down. It's cyclical. And I know that, you know, when, when the time to strike is right, you should. And now is the time. So I'd encourage everybody to get off the sidelines if you're thinking about it. If you're twiddling your thumbs trying to get expert and learning all this stuff, forget about that. Go out and do something. Just take some forward motion, take some first steps and go out there and buy your first or your 17th or your 86th house and, uh, and get going because there is a lot of money. I'm going to tell you, you guys, maybe if I'm on the Monday call or Tuesday, I'm going to tell you about a house that we just sold this morning that we put on the market last night. And um, well, at least we've got two offers on. I'm not sure which we're going to take both over ask um and you know both great offers and and that's for almost no time at all on the market so uh and that's a rehab thing we'll talk about that in more detail i'll show you some pictures next week all right that's it for news you can use for today